thank you for clicking on this video. This is actually episode six. So if you haven't seen any of our videos so far for this song Sunday afternoon, I want to encourage you to go back and watch as many episodes as you can. I totally understand that this is might be a struggle because a lot of these videos are long and I'm often long winded, but I do appreciate those of you that make it through to the end or however long you make it through this video at all. Today's video is all about recording the acoustic guitar on the song Sunday Afternoon. We're doing something a little bit different. So at the beginning, I want to uh, have you listen to what we actually ended up with on Studio One. This channel is all about making music from the beginning to the end. So you're going to see every step of the way. Maybe drums is your thing. You may want to go watch the drums video. All this is leading towards a finale, which Lana and I will sit down and listen to the end result of all these weeks and weeks of recording instruments and the mixing and vocals and all that stuff. We'll listen to the end result, the final mix of this song Sunday Afternoon. So enjoy this video all about the acoustic guitar for the song Sunday Afternoon. the screen you'll see studio one on the left with all the tracks we've recorded so far i've done some gain some volume adjustment just so it's more pleasing to listen to i've turned down lana's scratch vocal because that's not going to be our final vocal but just give you just to give you a little bit of context of where we're at in the song and on the right side of the screen you'll see the guitar at about the point i started recording so here's sunday afternoon with the acoustic guitar added
Okay, so the video on the right, it was um, it was a little bit delayed. I, I didn't want you to hear the iPhone microphone. I wanted you to hear the microphone that I used to record. So, uh, But the performance, that was the performance that was being recorded. So let's just talk about how I recorded this. So this week I used the Warm Audio U... Wait, the Warm Audio WA-47. The main difference is that this is a tube, a large diaphragm condenser mic that is powered by a tube. So this box right here, this big box, basically supplies power to the microphone in ways that I do not understand. But basically, I've got a cable that runs from the microphone to the box and the cable that runs from the box to my interface, the Apollo Twin, which was running a 1084 preamp again. And then on the box here, you basically have a polar pattern selector. So you can, by switching this right here, you can switch this to an omnidirectional microphone. You can leave it cardioid, which is what I did for this video. Most of the time I leave it in cardioid. Or you can turn it all the way to the right and it's figure eight pattern. But uh, I'm using a different microphone, and I know you may be thinking, why so many different microphones? And I do think the same thing as well. I'm going off the assumption that every microphone I use has its own distinct character. I don't want to overuse one microphone, because what will end up happening when we get to the... This is more of kind of a mixing thing, but look at all these. We've got all these tracks here on Studio One. And if you've been watching the videos week by week, you know, I'm not trying to just throw a bunch of tracks at this song here, but we've got Lana Scratch Vocal. We've got six tracks set aside for drums. We've got the bass guitar. We have two acoustics I'll explain, explain in just a second. We've got the banjo track, and then we've got a stereo piano track. There's still going to be more tracks to add, but if every track, if for every track, every instrument, every vocal, if I use the same microphone what's going to happen is every microphone has its own frequency response. You can pull up these charts whenever you're purchasing a microphone. And that curve, if you've got a microphone that, let's say that this one emphasizes the high end, it gives a little bump, makes things sound really crispy and exciting. Well, if I use this microphone on 20 tracks, it's not going to make everything sound crispy and exciting. It's going to make everything probably sound really harsh because what you're doing is you're taking you're taking the unique characteristics of that one thing and you're multiplying it times 20, which can be either sometimes a good thing or sometimes a bad thing. So I'm trying to use a diversity of microphones when I can so that I'm not putting myself into a rut when I'm trying to mix the song later. Now I do use the Warm Audio 87, which is based off of a Neumann U87. I use that a lot, mostly because I've seen the frequency response chart of the U87, and for the most part, the Warm Audio's 87, it's very flat. So since I know it's flat, I know it's not trying to add or take anything away. Uh, let's see. So anyway, uh, you'll see from the video here, but I had the, 80, the 47 upside down. There is literally no particular reason... I did that other than with the mic stand that it's on, in order for it to be somewhat near the sound hole in the neck of the acoustic when I'm seated, the ergonomics of it is just difficult to maneuver it to where it's right side up like this. You can see how tall it is already. If I'm seated, I need this capsule to be down here. And with the microphone stand I have it right now, I have to flip it upside down. That's literally the only reason I did that. Again, I'm using the reflection filter. As you can see, I'm looking over to the right towards this computer. I'm putting, trying to put the filter every week. I'm trying to put some sort of filter or wall between me and a bunch of these smooth surfaces coming from my computer or whatever. I haven't shown this in any of my videos yet, but as you can see these green panels behind all this stuff, the green panels, they're about I think we did four inches thick. So four, three or four inches thick and uh, two feet wide, about four feet tall. This wall that I'm speaking into that you cannot see right now, 
it's full of acoustic treatment. So what that's trying to do is minimize any sort of unnecessary reflections in the room, trying to make it sound that when I snap my fingers, you don't hear, you don't hear the snapping to keep going. I still like to use the reflection filter because of the computer, everything like that. You also notice that my iPad's missing. I'm pretty sure I left it charging at the church and basically made it through just using, you'll see me reach for this mouse, just a wireless mouse, and I'm looking over at the screen with my blind eyes trying to maneuver. Okay. The other thing is I was using, this is the instrument. I recorded the acoustic uh, for, this is the Martin OM21. Uh, OM stands for orchestra model, so it's a little small. It's uh, it is small, but it's not meant to give me, it's usually not by itself. So the smaller the guitar, the more I think it can kind of stand out in the track, cut a little bit more. Uh, but it's also never going to have the bass and stuff that you would get maybe from a Hummingbird or one of the uh, Martin D series acoustic. The only thing I'm trying to do acoustic wise with the microphone is to point it and pick this thing up again. I'm usually aiming somewhere for this area. So I want the microphone not to be on the sound hole. What will happen is if I put this on the sound, if I put the microphone near the sound hole, it'll just be a bunch of boomy, gargly sounds. If I put it too much on the neck, then it's going to not have that low end. This is not, like I said, it's not a low end producing instrument. So I don't want to put it too much up here. I don't want to put it too much there. I've usually found that aiming for this area of the instrument gets the job done the only other thing i watched a video on youtube that came up on eric valentine's channel and i'll just say that it ruined me as far as recording these acoustic guitars and guitars in general because he started talking about how we tune guitars and especially how awful the interval of a major third sounds on guitars if you're in standard tuning and the reason that is is that we basically have gotten used to this tuning to where when you tune a guitar most of the time if you're using like i've got a boss tuner it will get me tuned to eadgbe and then i can pretty much play in any key i want to and it's going to sound pretty good the problem is the major third the intervals of a third like from g to b for this song Every time I played a B with the G, the B would be out of tune. So it would actually be, I believe it's sharp by like 13, 14 cents. And I watched that video. It, it meant nothing to me before. If you told me that your major thirds are going to be 14 cents off every time you record, I would have just brushed it aside saying, that sounds so minimal. I can't imagine that being a big deal. But when you hear the difference between something that is in tune and something that's 14 cents off, it suddenly became like nails on a chalkboard. And I watched that literally right before we went to record for this song. Okay, so jumping back to Studio One. So the only thing I was thinking was that when I was playing my G shapes on the guitar, What changed is that if I was playing this G, if I was playing this G shape here with the open B string, what was happening is when I was in tune with my boss tuner, this B, stuck out like a sore thumb. So what I decided to do is that this song is in C. So basically I have chords I wanted to play were C, G over B. And instead of G over B being like this, I decided to cover up the B string like that. A minor, F. When I went to G, I wanted to do this, but because of the tuning issues, I decided to make it a full G chord and my pointer finger is actually muting the A string, which would have been the major third. So in this chord right here, 
It's actually more like a power chord because there's only the notes G. I'm muting the B string. We have an open D, an open G. I've made the B string a D and G. So literally this is nothing but G, D, and G all the way up. Sounds a lot cleaner than Okay. I might have actually already compensated for that on the guitar. So basically in Eric Valentine's video, what he was saying was that if you know where your major third is at, so if you're playing a bunch of chord shapes, like if your B string is where your major third, your third interval is going to be, then play all the chords you can with that third being on the B string, but then take the B string and flatten it by 13 or 14 cents and it will actually sound more in tune than if you just tune the B string right to zero, okay? Maybe we'll get into that a little more some other time, but here on the song, what I defaulted to do, you see there's three different acoustic tracks. I'm gonna go ahead and get rid of the um, video of the acoustic there, because I think we got the gist, but there's three different tracks. I've got acoustic, acoustic one left, acoustic two right. This acoustic track and this acoustic one left is actually the same take. So what I did was I duplicated my acoustic track and what I wanted to do was have moments throughout the song where you go from the acoustic guitar being mono right in the middle and then on verse two, that mono right down the middle acoustic guitar gets split left and right. So now the acoustic guitar track, I made a cut right here after verse one. And starting on verse two, now you've got two acoustics. Let's take a listen to what that basically does. So, and then acoustic guitar two, right. I did one more pass through the entire song. And as you can see with the waves, I basically just went through and created a second acoustic guitar track, but the second acoustic guitar track is panned to the right, and it's really only emphasizing some big chords every now and then, okay? Here's what the acoustics sound like if all I did was, let's just say I had the acoustic one and acoustic guitar two, where everything's pretty much mono, and then we've got the acoustic guitar on the right. Okay, so that acoustic guitar is right down the middle. By duplicating the track and creating, shifting all that acoustic guitar to the left, here's what that sounds like now. Okay, now that guitar that was in the middle, going into verse two, that middle guitar gets shifted to the left, hard pan left. And then the second acoustic guitar fills in the right side by filling up uh, by being on the right. Okay. Let's see. I really minimized what I was playing on the acoustic. I was using one of these picks. Let's see. Okay, so this pick, I believe is, it's called Big Stubby. So <laughs> I believe this is meant to be like a bass pick, but it's just, it's really, really thick. It gives me a little bit of more girth from some of the strings and all that. It works good for this guitar, I think. Basically, I'm just using this, and then on the video you can see it as well. It's a lot of down strumming, really mechanical, I'm trying to not stand out because like I mentioned earlier, I've already got a banjo doing stuff. I've got a piano doing some interesting stuff. I've got a bass guitar doing interesting stuff. There's so many different instruments going on that the less chaotic the acoustic guitar is, the acoustic guitar is going to be that robotic. Hopefully you um, 
always know where the acoustic is throughout the song. So let me just play the acoustic guitar track for a little bit and then we'll introduce some of the other instruments, okay? So uh, one thing I've gotten away from is when I'm double tracking guitars, meaning I'm going to do one pass all the way through the song, with one guitar, and then I'm going to do an entirely extra recording of that same guitar. When I'm doubling the guitars, if I'm just going to play the exact same thing twice, especially with a clean song like this, I'm not doing anything with big distorted guitars, it ends up just sounding like, it ends up just sounding mono. So I really like that kind of effect. As you see, I was kind of doing this with my hands, but it's not exactly predictable what the acoustic guitar, where the acoustic guitar is going to be. You go from later on in the song, the guitar goes back to the middle to kind of finish up. You can see that the acoustic guitar, the second acoustic guitar isn't even playing certain sections. And then when you combine that, let's add the banjo and the bass guitar to some of that. And let's take a listen. Okay, so uh, all of those guitar type instruments, hopefully you're hearing what I'm hearing where they're all kind of like they have their own thing going on. The acoustic is very mechanical. The band, the, the, the band, <laughs> the banjo is uh, sometimes just giving a strum, letting you know that it's still there. It's not gone away, but then the banjo really comes out on the chorus. And when we get to mixing, I start using compression and things like that out th these differences between the instruments they'll really start to poke their heads out when they need to as it is right now all the faders are pretty much just set for volume differences uh, but when we go to mix that stuff's going to come soaring out so last thing i want to say with the about the acoustic guitar uh, before we wrap up here i want you to kind of hear it with the other instruments i'm going to leave lana's scratch vocal muted uh just so you can kind of hear the these are the keeper tracks okay when she was doing her scratch vocal we're not super concerned with the timing she was not even listening to any of these tracks she was listening to kind of the scratch track from another piano okay so when we go back and do the vocal it will kind of fit in more timing wise and uh, dynamics and things like that but here's just a little bit of the song with just the instruments Let's pick up uh, verse four into going into the chorus three. Here we go.
Let's fix that real quick. Like my acoustic guitar track got nudged a little bit. How did that happen? Let's see. A lot of listening today, but acoustic guitar is pretty straightforward. Uh, I was going to tackle the electric guitar. We've been doing a lot of necessary yard work the past few days, and my back is, I'm such a weakling, but uh, <laughs> my back is kind of freaking out at the moment. So I may get to recording the electric guitar this afternoon. I don't know if I'm going to have time to get the video up afterward. But I hope you enjoy this video. Please subscribe and stay tuned for next week because we will be adding the electric guitar, which is really the last of the main instruments we're going to be adding. I may uh, end up adding some auxiliary tracks, so we'll do an entire video that may include things like an organ pad, some string elements, uh, shakers, tambourines, all of that in one video. So make sure you subscribe. But thanks so much for watching this far and we will see you next week.